Well, welcome everyone. We have Andrew, Rodney, Daniel, Rebecca, and myself, Michael, so far. And Rebecca is rejoining us after a hiatus. And I would love to know uh, what you will be working on in the near future. So yeah, I uh, um, back working on UEFI. Um, I noticed that that there's a pause during boot where XHCI times out, and it looks like there's some sort of mismatch between uh, what Beehive is um, sending and what the XHCI driver in UEFI is expecting. And so, yeah, it just um, sp spends like, I don't know, two or three seconds timing out. So I'm just trying to figure out what's going wrong uh, so we can speed up the boot time. Um, I also noticed there's a um, handoff block hob thing that um, is only finding a single CPU, uh, even though I've specified like four CPUs. Um, so yeah, I'll also be digging into that. Excellent. And that's a spectacular segue to some work that Daniel did at the request of Corvin and John. If you're looking at the, the stream, well, uh, Daniel did a CPU startup count test in which he just incremented the number of vCPUs in a guest. And Corvin responded this morning about the fact that, you know, 10 second spreads is something to look into. And for those on this topic, well, uh, he's curious how other hypervisors are behaving, reasonable question, and uh, how can we get scientific? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that Colin Percival has been uh, working on TS log to make nifty flame graphs and such about this. Let me bring that up just for, for those who have never heard of it. It's pretty cool work um, because he's working on Amazon EC2 and friends, he's like, well, let's see what things are doing. And, you know, are we waiting on devices that we no longer care about? So there's a quick answer there. And Rebecca, that may also help your work. And welcome, Patrick H. Good evening, everyone. So, I, I didn't want to hijack that, Rebecca. Any anything else related to your investigations? Uh, nope. Um, oh. I'm working on some base tools and general build improvements. Uh, so you'll be able to build um, both base tools and ETK, ETK2 using the system Clang compiler. And I... <sighs> Probably won't make it for the upcoming stable tag, but uh, I'm converting it from requiring bash to re just requiring a POSIX compatible shell. Excellent. Has EDK2 only been, say, GCC buildable? It required GCC uh, to build base tools. Uh, so it was a requirement. Um, yeah, we, we needed GCC, um, although, well, actually, Clang was pretty broken, um, and the build is actually still broken because it doesn't embed the resources uh, we, we depend on, um, and so, yeah, I, I need to fix that last issue, and then, yeah, Clang should be ready to go. Fantastic. I, and, go ahead. I have a side question that's UEFI beehive related in that i saw recently a commit that renamed the port or package for the uefi edk um beehive firmware is there any explanation to why we needed to modify vm run.sh and change that name um i'm not familiar with that it used to be called UEFI dash. Oh, I'd have to. I don't have it. Oh, UEFI dash beehive dot ft. Yes. Right. Um. So yeah. Did, now, sorry. Go on. Did that package get renamed? 
Um, the file name got renamed, so it's now, I think, um, so now we have, we split it into code and variables, and so what you want to be doing is copying the beehive underscore vars into somewhere that's writable, um, so then you can customize no, the... No, no, this, uh, oh. this was a reference to the name of the package. Oh, no, um... Oh, um, the like the port name. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, we have um consolidated um the different ports down to a single port, uh, that then runs different flavors. Um, so the flavors support like macchiato bin, uh, Quimu, beehive, etc. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I migrate to fourteen, my my package names that I've been installing is going to be gone, and I'll have to. Use this new flavored package. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, um, this is this is yeah. an uh, people don't think about this, but that's when you rename packages like that and stuff. It's a real upgrade breaker. It is, yes, um, yeah. It's unfortunate, but it's yes, it's yeah. um, definitely a one-time break at least. Will... Yeah, but you have you have, you have yeah. to understand that there are several of these that occur every major revision. I have to go hunt down packages. Mm -hmm. So. You may say it's a one-time thing, but it's a it's a recurring one-time theme of things. Right. Yep. So, I understand. Okay. Probably okay. slightly off topic, but why don't you when 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 that happens, why don't you guys keep the old package name around and then have the other package be a dependency on it? So that you so that you can still do the name change, but not break existing users. Does that make sense? This is this isn't the the group to be addressing this issue. This is a port management. I, I, yeah, you're right. I it's off topic, but yeah. I just I wanted yeah. to understand why that package had gotten renamed. Now I know. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I would love to see more better support for the moved uh, file. Um, so like tooling could like currently I think the um like mention of the flavor is very much just information for the user. Well, It'd be really nice if yeah if the tools actually parsed that and said yeah hey I'll now go and build this flavor of the package instead. I'm wondering if something can't be done in package itself to say in the database files to say that this old package name has been renamed to this new package name. Um, that's what the mood file is, isn't it? I don't know. Uh, Rebecca, is there still a beehive firmware meta package, and would that be impacted? Yes, there is. I don't think it is impacted. Um, by the way, I'll just go and find the moved um, file. Um, oh, it's Seagit, isn't it? Org. There we go. And welcome, JWD, unless that's someone's phone following along. <laughs> and is this package change tied to, say, 14 release, or just happen to be in the current quarter and such as live? Um, yes, yeah, so it is, um, no, the package rename was done like several months ago, okay. like probably, probably like a year or so now. Oh, um, goodness. so yeah, it was just in, um, the ports, um, ports master or main. Hmm. It's, it does not affect 13.2 as of yet. Because I haven't seen it hit. I know the only thing that triggered me about it was I saw a commit to VM run.sh to to change the reference to the um the port. Hmm. And I thought that rather peculiar. Anything else relating to firmware in EDK2? Uh, not you, for me. You, you've you made this comment. But, oh, never mind. Never mind. Has Upstream been welcoming of patches? It sounds like that was a challenge at times. Um, 
yeah it I mean, it's working better um okay. I, I i'm now a edk2 tools maintainer so i have commit rights um so yeah I, it's much easier to get changes committed um it's still a problem getting reviews though um i've got a big tool chain chain tool chain patch series um of like 16 rating patches uh that i'm trying to get in um but yeah just really not getting not getting the reviews i need on it uh so sp speaking from previous experience does it help to break them up into smaller reviews given that that blocked say vitaly and corvin and others who had ambitious projects that just were too much to swallow um yes except um they are um the project is very much into big patch series and oh, okay. like having it all in one go um I don't know why, but that's the thing. Interesting. Cool. Well, it's great to have you back. Daniel, I know you're often pretty busy, and we, you did get a mention here on your vCPU count. Uh, thank you very much for doing that count work. And uh, note the questions from Corvin. I don't know if that's something you have resources to do, but as we sort of paint this picture, uh, let yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I do have a I do have a Mac with VMware here that I could I could uh, retrofit my scripts, and, and I should probably improve it as well. I think the the actual uh, timing sensitivity is about zero point one seconds. It's not it's not actually two hundredths of a, it's a, it's not a hundredth of a second. So I you know I could probably revise this as well, and then. Producing uh, some other results that compare it with, um, you know, with some Mac VMs. I, I have a I have a couple that I could could test with and see if uh, if if that's any if that's any different. There is a QEMU thing that works with the hypervisor framework for Mac, and I mean, I'm just mentioning that because I literally have it right with me within um, reach. I could probably set up a yeah, I could probably set up a KVM box as well. Um, that has enough CPUs. Um, yeah. Oh, I have, if, if you don't mind rewinding back to the previous topic or something tangential to the previous Please. topic, I was wondering what the, what the status is on, um, on, on getting, you know, Linux to Linux to pick the right uh, loader automatically when you know, during an EFI boot. Um, I I forget what was I forget what was going on. Like we needed memory to to be changed on the on the EFI loader or something. There was there was some other step that was missing, but uh, I haven't thought about it in a while. And just I I just had to install Debian from scratch the other day, and I was like, oh yeah, right. I have to I have to rename this to to boot x sixty four. Um, so that it oh boots. right, yes, that's been fixed. Oh really? How how fantastic! So uh, uh, that's going to be in a uh, will that be in a point release in FreeBSD, or do I need to download the uh, current? Uh, which FreeBSD are you running? Uh, Thirteen two uh, release. Okay, I don't know if that's in there, um, but yeah, now um, the boot ROM parameter uh, has two file names. Um, one is the code, one is the vars. And if the vars file is in a writable location, uh, then installing OSs will update that file with the bootloader entries. That's fantastic. I'm going to check to see, maybe, I, maybe I'm using an older uh, version. But I'm not. I, I believe this will be fixed on 13.2 if he upgrades his firmware. Port, right. Um, so I I don't know. Um, I know I I'm running fourteen, so I don't, I'm yeah, not I think uh, backports. I believe all the yeah. functionality of of the UEFI vars, um, and stuff is actually in the EDK two port. And so if he upgrades to have that functionality, Linux will be able to then set variables and the bootloaders will get set correctly. Okay, yeah, you know what? I did definitely did not update my loader. So even if I am up to date, I have not done the correct test of this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that a whirl. That's fantastic, I'm glad to hear it. 
Okay, Michael, on this thing you're editing right now, VM run.sl, actually, it was just a, do a pointer. It was a documentation correction. It was okay. not actually, oh, it doesn't affect know. the running code. It affects the output of the usage message that tells you you might want to go install this port. So, okay. I do, I don't know what happened. I think you deleted some text somewhere about Daniel B's kindly ran these vCPU boot counts. There, there were comments that indicated what CPU he did that on and some other stuff, and I don't see it anymore. Um, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. That's you This is regarding work. Corbin's uh, update on his TPM emulation. He just this morning reported success there. Okay, that was done on that. Event. Okay, about this table you have up here that goes to 50 cores, there's no de description at all of the physical machine which means that's pretty useless data. I mean, was that on a four core machine or was that on a 64 core machine? Folks, during the pause, um, this is JWD. I apologize for not responding earlier. I was having problems with my microphone. Um, <laughs> my, I didn't, I'm sorry I didn't put it out there. My name is John Dabosky, Um and I've, just as an FYI, I have been using FreeBSD uh, since the 1990s. Um, and I saw this, I've seen this meeting a couple times come across and today I actually realized that you were meeting and I thought I'd try to join and, and say hello and see what's going on. And maybe in the future I can help with a few things. I am a relatively large consumer of uh, QEMU and uh, Beehive uh, with some of the stuff we do. Excellent. Welcome. And yeah, feel free to be a fly on the wall, but don't be shy about interjecting if you have a tip or a trick or a question. Uh, no problem. Excellent. And yes, I, I'm, I'm, I am very aware of some of the, uh, the EDK2 and, and UEFI issues that we, that we have. Uh, may I ask what guest operating systems you run under Beehive and QEMU? Um, we typically run um, a, some variation of Linux. Uh, we also run FreeBSD. I tend to run, uh, store, I'll use the term storage servers, um, where we do, uh, uh, PCI pass through of the actual, uh, for instance, HBAs. Uh, the Linux systems are typically a, a VM front end for running something like Kates or similar. Uh, how's Kate spelled? Uh, it, Kubernetes. Oh, Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Okay, eight. Oh, the number eight. Yes, of course. I, my, my apologies. I, it, I, I, we, we refer to it as Kate. Yes. Sure. That's cool. Uh, yeah. You're not alone in pronouncing it that way. I'm sorry. I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, cool. Welcome, welcome, and thank you, Daniel, for punching in some technical details. Uh, so, so Rodney, uh, E526, uh, I'm guessing dual socket. No, two of them, yep. It was covered by a little anonymous pumpkin. I'll go ahead, Rebecca. Um, sorry, so um, that um, CPU, uh, did that have 56 threads in total, or was it like the 112 threads in total? It's 56 threads, so yeah, half the number of CPUs, CPU <sighs> cores. Okay, um, because I'm just thinking, I know that SMT can add some kind of overhead um, since it shares resources. Um, so I have an AMD Epic server with um, 128 real cores and 256 threads. Um, so yeah, if if there's concern about having it running with hyperthreading, then I can disable that and um, yeah, run it again if that need be. Right. Yeah, right. I'm not gonna. I'm only. Yeah. So if I wanted, I had an epic. Also, I wonder if I can get that freed because that would be that would obviously be a lot better. Um, it would be actually interesting to compare those two. Um, oh, to compare with SMTP on and off uh, to see what yes. what uh, what impact that would have. I think that would be useful. I have two epics. I wonder if I can. But I don't. So you have one that you can. You don't have to. That that you have free enough to. Um, 
Yeah, I have, I have some yeah, production yeah, yeah. stuff on. Uh, Right. So no, mine mine is um, purely running uh, like test stuff. It's currently running Windows. Um, it's, it's got Linux. So I can put uh, put FreeBSD on there. Um, the only issue is that with Beehive, I have seen messages um, from the kernel about um, I don't know, like I don't know, like hardware stuff that it's not entirely happy with. So that might be an issue. I don't think I've actually tried running Beehive on it. I'm currently running um, all my work on an AMD Epic embedded system. Um, yeah, I need, I need to try that server. Speaking of AMD, I have a hyper selfish question about uh, ACPI issues on a recent CPU on a new ThinkPad that absolutely fails with uh, FreeBSD. I have documented it pretty heavily on an existing ticket here. So if anyone knows ACPI, please do chime in and see if there's th other things I can mask out. I've tried the without or the ACPI debug option in the kernel. And so it's a whole epic journey there that you're welcome to pursue on your own. <laughs> uh, sorry, what laptop is it? Uh, it is a T14 ThinkPad with this specific CPU. I'll tell you for all the scrolling, but it is the the Ryzen Pro 6850U Gen ah, 3 T14. Okay. I hope to have it ready by uh, working by BSD CAN, but we shall see. It might have to run another operating system. We shall mm. see. I have a ThinkPad. It's um, Intel and um, probably slightly older, but mm -hmm. um, I can try running FreeBSD, see if it runs into problems, and see if I can debug any ACPI issues that it might have. Because awesome. um, I have actually been doing lots of ACPI, like writing um, AML and stuff. So, um, oh, fascinating. Yeah, I can and have a look. For what it's worth, with the debug kernel, it, it spit out this text, if I can find it. Uh, oh, that just arrived. So there's new comments. Great. Um, It'll be right yes. up at the top, I guess. Yeah. Oh, there. That there we go. means anything to you. Great. If not, such is life. I'll drop in the chat and I will shut up about this. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will ask you for more information. We'll probably want a dump of um, tables and stuff. Excellent. Okay. Welcome, Brian. Uh, Brian V. Uh, not to be too all over, all over the map, but uh, Daniel, thank you. And it sounds like you do have, uh, you've set yourself a to-do. Yes, excellent. Um, any other topics relating to, to access that startup yeah. performance? Okay, and uh, so here are Corbin's same questions there. I'll put them in a little more context. You've given yourself the to-do. I've selfishly asked about that. Welcome, John. And yes, you got your question there answered, Daniel. And again, Corbin has TPM emulation news. It is working, and he's going to be talking about that at BSD CAN. Uh, Patrick, welcome. You have uh, been periodically blessing our, 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 our little group here. Uh, do you have news or questions? I uh, want, first want to say congratulations to everyone involved and, and thanks for all the great work. Uh, UEFI uh, configuration persistence is a fantastic feature that people have long asked for. And uh, TPM emulation is just incredible because I'm already pondering uh, where we would go once support for Windows 10 ends. And if we can have uh, Windows 11 uh, running in Beehive by that time, that would be awesome. Uh, that time might be in two weeks when he presents. Yeah, it depends on when these uh, updates will land in TrueNAS, probably. <laughs> but of course, if necessary, I will set up a plain FreeBSD box to run our Windows workloads. Let's see where we're going. Um, so really, really thanks. I have one minor thing to add. I'll just Please. go to Google document. Um, where are we? Um, we have had, I've had frequent complaints from TrueNAS users about a lockup of VMs. Interesting. 
planes and planes. I've I can clean up your text. Blast it in, in there. I'll fix it. Add a lock. Add Linux predominantly. VM's last report was probably, and then we have this thread over here. And the surprise was that uh, Vitaly uh, joined in the TrueNest forum oh, good. and asked people, oh, is that the correct spelling? Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, Oh, Vitaly by this patch. And it looks like success. And so is do you know it's, without looking the components patching what? Is it in safe? firmware or something more in the OS and it might be an uphill battle. Uh, no, that's that's a patch that's a patch to VMM. Oh. It's oh, okay. uh, the handling of virtual interrupts. Sorry, I'm at the end of my words. I don't know how any of this works, but it's, it's a patch to our uh, BF implementation. And uh, you can patch a 13.1 or a 13 stable kernel, obviously, and uh, use that to boot TrueNAS without too much many problems and that seems to fix the problem do you know if he or anyone has set up a pull request to the uh true sources to put it on a silver platter for them not that i knew i think i'm going so as far as i know nobody has opened a trouble ticket on their jira but i i probably will do so okay and um I don't think we need a pull request because they follow FreeBSD 13 stable with their own source. So it's just a question of when they resync their tree to the latest Git version of FreeBSD. Got it. If if this fix is in 13, which I'm not quite sure right now, let's see. Repository. Where's the commit? Well, thank you for that heads up. But that's all that I have to report for now. And thank you for having your links handy. Always appreciated. Uh, Brian V, did you have a chance to play with your new hardware? <laughs> Nothing new at the moment, unfortunately. I understand you've been under various rocks. And uh, Rodney, do you have any news on multiple multi-booting, for lack of a better term, of, say, ZFS-based OSs? namely say FreeBSD and Proxmox and friends? Because I could sure use that like right now. <laughs> no time, well, let me see, did I spend any cycles at all? Yeah, I spent a couple of cycles and it looks completely doable because I have found the way that Proxmox ZFS booting is not as near as elegant as I thought it was, is what their silly little Proxmox bootloader actually does is they're they're loading the kernel and init R uh, init FS and it RD and it RD from the EFI partition. So it should be just like almost a no-brainer. You should be able to, to other than the um, I guess the biggest last piece I need to figure out is how to untwist the commonly named data sets. And that both free, FreeBSD uses a VAR data set and Proxmox has a VAR data set. So, the, and they're quite different contents. So I, my thoughts on that was to untwist that and have a VAR-FreeBSD and a VAR-PMOX or PVE, and then use a symbolic link in the root file system that is the boot environment that points to the proper VAR and you'll just you'll have them both mounted, but you'll only be using one or the other. It's Would there be any reason not to simply nest that per boot environment? And yeah, yeah you lose boot some share. I don't believe no, because then you're not. Well, think about that. Can you have a? 
you can have a completely nested tree under a boot environment and on FreeBSD, the, uh, what is it? Uh, ZFSBE, I believe, or no, or just a, one of the ZFS RC script just mounts them as appropriate and off you go. Yeah, but that script won't exist in Proxmox. They might have some kludgy equivalent. Uh, you know. <laughs> probably not. Um, and actually, for the work I'm doing, I actually do want. Uh, I want both. I want all the data sets mounted. Uh, true. I'm just saying a nested data set as opposed to a sh ones that shared between uh, boot environments on the same OS, but. Those are indeed the, the questions. Yeah, but it, it's the, the, I guess I just need to conduct the experiment to find that I can actually copy my PVE route over and the kernels into the EFI and then boot it on the same system. Okay. It should just work. It, it would be an EFI layer selection of, of which loader you select, and if you select the Proxmox loader, it's going to grab the kernels. And then I guess there's the last piece to make sure it doesn't break the PVE kernel update management stuff. Oh, true. Yeah. Having a, yeah, a one-time clue does not and, help. And, and, and other pieces like they, they Proxmox, you know, they're assuming things like their pool name is our pool and some other stuff because they've hard coded that in their installers. So I believe they've also got, I've run into a couple of scripts that actually have that hard coded in it. So if I change the pool name, it's going to break things. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, that's, that's all the progress on that thing. It's mostly just mental process, no actual experiments well keep us posted that's indeed compelling and thank you patrick for your updates to your minutes there save me some ish, some trouble um other hot topics ideas questions uh daniel anything else in production in your world um, nothing as exciting as all this fun technical stuff, but, uh, I do want to try to get, um, some, you know, I, I want to take another stab at looking for, uh, potential graphical interfaces for, um, for management by, by less technical users. Um, I'm currently setting up just XFCE with a whole bunch of VNCs connected to it and, you know, just documenting scripts really well. But I do have uh, some some low, you know lower level technicians who I need to do maintenance time now and then, and you know of course it's it can you know when they see VMware they're like oh wow look at all this <laughs> I can I can edit the I can edit the number of CPUs right from a little prompt. Um, so I'm starting to think that this might be something worth worth pursuing if I want to scale a bit more. So um, while it doesn't help Beehive, a colleague is using Webmin for their NAS to reasonable success. And I'd be curious if there are any Perl hackers here who want to take a look at Proxmox as a GUI because it's it's rather independent of its underlying Debian OS. And Proxmox Beehive would not be a terrible thing per se. Huh. That's I would interesting. love to see but Proxbox Beehive. But it's uh, but it's an OS, isn't it? Like it, I, it, it. I mean, no, no. Prox Prox Proxmox is Debian with a GUI written on top of it. They don't use libvirt even. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so it, the the biggest part would be the UI to to steal the UI and make it underlying function with beehive well i would throw some money at that understood so yeah i'm not messing around here because i see those writings on those walls and and when i mention another os on my new nifty amd thinkpad well it's probably proxmox and one key point for those say 
in oh, TrueNAS land, you can throw packages on Proxmox. I spun up XFCE and a web browser, and I'm hope to have Wi-Fi working by the end of the day. And it's like, well, I have a laptop. It just happens to have a nifty GUI front end to uh, the hypervisor and containers. Go ahead. And, and the, the Proxmox functionality is actually contained in Debian packages in that you can actually take a standard Debian system and layer the Proxmox tooling on top of it and run Proxmox. Correct, Proxmoxify it. And uh, Zential, which is sort of an office server, takes a similar approach. You can remove it and leave a configured Debian system, which is quite elegant. <clears throat> And Patrick rightfully points out TrueNAS, but packages in TrueNAS means, well, spin up your jail, et cetera. You also mentioned BVCP, which I looked at for a talk, and it looks like they share binaries on GitHub, and it's, in fact, completely proprietary, which was limiting, I suppose. Uh, and, of course, CBSD might, in, I don't know if they have a GUI yet, but I know they have a curses interface. Anyway. So yeah, that I'm, I'm, it's good to hear that there is that enthusiasm there. And for what it's worth, my little organization has been a Proxmox uh, partner since oh, about a month ago. So I will have a little closer tie to them. Anyhow, uh, this has been a great spread of topics in about 40 minutes. Uh, let me think what else. up. Uh, for those who have not been attending, such as oh, uh, Rod and Rebecca and friends and the new attendee, uh, the Beehive call sprouted a jail call. And there's clearly been pent up interest in that. So there is a similar Google Doc. There are recordings on YouTube. Maybe bring that up super quick um, with a nice auto completion. Those talks have been going up to oh, four hours, about three of which have been recorded at times. And it's they've been resulting in code. And people actually watch some of these long, ridiculously long videos. I'll put, drop a link in here. Uh, you're all welcome to participate. It is wide open. We do loosely ping pong between uh, developer and uh, and production user topics. However, a neat thing is that we've had presentations on, say, oh, it's in the show notes, but uh, a great presentation on uh, containers on Linux, and then a fantastic recent one on zones, just to see what's being done in the you know, other environments. Uh, I think even the second to last was about zones. So it's 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 been exciting and again pent up and people quickly identified many of the same operational concerns just like UEFI in this context like yep we're all we're all in agreement of what needs to happen and indeed Patrick it is fantastic news that so much progress is taking place um, so there feel free to take a peek at those and you are all welcome to join and little mini presentations are welcome and that might be something appropriate for these calls anyhow. Whew. Um, I know as of what, two days ago, Brian, you will be at BSD CAN. I will be there. Will anyone else be present? Daniel, can you roll on over? It's here, not too far away. Eh? <laughs> oh, to CAN, not this time. Everybody's asking me. I uh, my, my brother's turning 50. I told him not to do it. Oh, geez. Um, yeah. But uh yeah but he's bring doing him. it anyway bring so. him hey there'll be a social <laughs> event does that coincide close enough I mean, he wouldn't awesome. understand a single word <laughs> at the whole conference ah uh, well by the end then that should be straightened out <laughs> okay uh, next year I'm, I'm committed cool oh rodney patrick john no, I'm, uh, I submitted a tutorial suggestion for uh, EuroBSDCon, but I'm probably not traveling overseas this year. Understood. I'm, this year's travel allowance is, is going to a trip to Mauritius. Nice. So, okay. 
anyone who thinks of coming, Coimbra will be just awesome, I guess. <laughs> EuroBSDCon in September. Yes, that is exciting. <clears throat> I've added your notes, Rebecca. Thank you. Well, now, um, any other topics, questions, concerned, I, concerns, ideas, wish list items? Uh, this is uh, John uh, yeah. speaking again. I Welcome. just wanted to pull back to where you folks were talking about Proxmox, et cetera. Um, the, my management structure has for years been trying to, to uh, have a GUI front end, um, and I've not had a lot of luck. I have not spent a lot of time with Proxmox, um, and I, I don't want to seem negative, that, but the, the issue that I am dealing with is that I have a I have technical debt for uh, over a decade of a system where we keep the configuration of a VM and then I can take that configuration and generate a QEMU front end for it or a, a Beehive front end to, to bring it up. Uh, things work both ways. Um, I, but the, the interest in a GUI is definitely a uh, you, I mean, plus one for, for me. I, just, I wanted to make that statement. Um, what do you consider the gold standard of such GUIs? And don't say the Windows app for VMware from many moons ago. <laughs> um, you can. You can. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very hesitant to say that um, I am in the minority. Um, most people love VMware. Um, I tend to be the one who does uh, CLI. And, you know, almost all of my work is automated from cron jobs or Jenkins or other, you know, various automation tools. But to ha make management happy, what would they like to see? Either a VMware clone, Proxmox is good enough. Something. Oh, I think they would. would I think they would absolutely love a VMware clone. Um, mm -hmm. But I also recognize how how difficult that could be. Um, I mean, VMware is still suffering from from technical problems at a last of its at least that's how far my user experience goes. Since they switched from a native Windows front end to that web thingy, they have a very feature rich modern web application with everything rendered in JavaScript in the front end. Don't know which framework they're using, but again and again, this gets out of sync with the server, and you have to reload the page or even relog in and stuff like that. At least that's my experience with it. So it's a lot less reliable than a native Windows front end used to be. Interesting. Although although the, the ESXi it's itself got... is not not by any means unreliable. It just keeps humming along, but I have to refresh the web front end frequently, at least while working in Safari on a Mac. It's gotten better. Yeah. Yeah. Eight eight is a big improvement. Really good. Even 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 I haven't even done the migration to eight. Even even the seven stuff was far better than what they initially started with when they uh, officially dropped support for the um, for the native client. I mean that was that was just bad. The the six dot something when when oh. the client was still available but deprecated. Yeah, that was that was ugly. I recall both even, on the even when interface, right. Even when they had completely stopped supporting it, and it wasn't available anymore, it was still not good. But it's they've got, still, they've gotten it's still not good. <laughs> they've gotten better. I wouldn't call it great. I do not know what type of environment some of you some of you folks work with, but it is worth noting that um, I work within the uh, R and D uh, environment. The it, which is different from the IT environment, which is definitely a huge VMware environment. Um, within R and D, we you know while VMware is one of them, uh, we use uh, Beehive and QEMU uh, also. 
I think as far as no, it's the other way. It's the other way around. IT is a huge consumer of uh, VMware. R and D is where we have the uh, QE move and Beehive uh, installations. Oh, at your organization, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I um I think as far as the the problems VMware has with their GUI, a lot of it has to do with the standard problem of, of enterprise software, which is to say it's a bunch of individual components that were never designed to work together, bodged together with <laughs> duct tape and chewing gum. <laughs> and it's only thoroughly tested in one browser on one platform. Color me shocked. Oh. So, oh, okay. Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, so, so, yeah, I was thinking, um, in addition to the um, physical configuration in terms of number of cores for the performance testing, I realized we should also know the um, configuration, the like what hardware was specified in the VM, uh, whether it has like uh, USB enabled and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I've asked uh, Daniel on that via the chat. Excellent. Yeah, I see your chat going on. Hey, feel free to ask that openly. Uh, he and I, you know, did that initial kind of sweep there, and it's fantastic to broaden this. Uh, so the exact launch syntax, emulated devices, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, yes. I figured, yeah, I, I used VMB Hive just because I, um, I figured it was apples to apples, and it probably wouldn't make it make too much of a difference but i mean i i think that i guess ideally i would use like uh oh shoot michael what's your nano bsd yeah, i will try to bang out an occam bsd minimum guess occam so bsd and boots up and immediately shuts down so that we're not waiting on some 10 mail timeouts or something to, to, yeah <laughs> so anyway uh that uh, it, your interest alone is encouragement to pursue that further so thank you my apologies for coming in late. The, what exactly is the test case that you're running there? Is it just a startup time measurement? Uh, so John mercifully removed the 16 hard-coded limit on vCPUs. And so yes. the sky's the limit, but uh, it looks like the uh, host CPU might peg at 100% while it's iterating through all the additional vCPUs. And we're trying to get a, a sense of like, well, okay, is that just... A, a few seconds different or potentially minutes of different just waiting on this initialization. So the hard facts there are appreciated. Okay. So you, you crank it from one vCPU, it boots in like 5.4 seconds and then an additional 10 seconds to get to 50 vCPUs, even though it's one simple little configuration change on just that. Yeah, but that's a whole lot of data initialization change. Indeed. You have to, yeah, in, yeah, okay. And did KVM do something different or is it potentially, I don't know, worse and VMware, et cetera. So just- So what, how, what, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how is that final boot seconds number arrived at? Are we pulling that from a, from D message somewhere? Are we pulling that from a cloud init statement? Um, I'm just, I'm just I'm so, I apologize. I'm, just, I'm like I said, I'm coming in late on this one. Uh, so yeah, Daniel just said it's the time to ping time to ping so you're basically measuring to the point where your network is available okay so what right, i figured what, that would be interest I, I just figured that was an interesting thing i guess i could do like time to prompt or or how, something something like that but that was no, that's that was something okay. easy I, to test ex, externally the network that you're using is a tap device it's netgraph Okay. How the ping command? Is, I take it you're, it's time to ping from the host. What's the ping command running on the host? How often are you sending a ping? Uh, continue. Uh, it's it's point. It's zero point one seconds, which is why I mentioned before. It's probably a zero point one second um, precision in my chart, not a hundred uh, hundredth of a second precision. 
Okay, so um, yeah, I see that XHI isn't specified. So um, yeah, my um, the two three second uh, timeout that I was seeing in UEFI won't be won't be in Won't there. fly. Cool. And keep in mind, this was like the smoke test initial generation of it. And I thank you for that. So we can get a lot more scientific. Yeah, this, but this was hey. this was how fast I could write in SH. Yeah, between um, phone but calls that's... or something. Um, yeah, exactly. It yeah. So might... we can tune this up. Sorry. Ahead, it, might, it might also be interesting doing a UEFI, how fast it can get to the UEFI shell, and then um, like write a UEFI shell script that just so reset dash s uh, to shut down um, and just see how quickly it gets from like run to power off. Ah, good point. Rebecca, are there any resources on UEFI scripting and applications? I've seen like a random VI port from here now and then, but it seems like a, a whole ecosystem that is not super obvious here to the rest of us. <laughs> yes, there is a UEFI shell specification uh, that has all the scripting language and stuff. Okay, but then is there sort of a, a, a source forge or GitHub of nifty scripts to do clever things with, like the firmware flashing and other handy things? Uh, no, um, probably the best resource, um, I don't know if it has any actual scripts, um, but the, um, what's it called, um, Refind, uh, the boot oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Re Refind is great. From, from an operator's point of view, I really appreciated the, uh, that UEFI has become a, a big business with all our servers and that vendors of, uh, devices that frequently need firmware updates uh, started to uh, publish their tools as EFI whatever binaries. Um, I don't really know how this works, but the, the point from, from an operator's point of view is that you just copy in, in the running FreeBSD your firmware update for Samsung SSD something to your EFI partition and then you schedule the maintenance window, boot into the UEFI shell, and, and start the firmware update. And you don't need to mess with USB drives, with MS-DOS, and, free DOS, uh, right? and, <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff that really deserves to die. Yeah, it makes it so okay. much easier. And then there's the um, capsule updates as well, which makes it even simpler because um, there's, I, I don't know if we've got it on FreeBSD yet, um, but on Linux, there's this firmware update manager. And then on my actual, actually on my ThinkPad laptop, um, I used to get UEFI um, firmware updates through Windows Update. Correct. And that's capsule as in the thing you might swallow. Yes. Okay. Capsule-based firmware recovery. Yes, yeah, so I've wondered if, you know, if you had, say, an HBA to flash, you a PCI pass it through, you aim the tools at it, and off you go without a whole lot of you know, drama. Um, yep. Yeah, I can't, I don't know if it uses the EFI file system or uh, EFI variables, but yeah, it's, cool. yeah, it's really nice. Uh, I'll drop a link here and in the Da, da, da. I, say, I hope that's the right link. Uh -huh. Capsule based firmware update and recovery. Yep, that looks like cool. it. Cool. Uh, I had not heard of that. Thank you so much for that. I would also put at least a very short plug in for the uh, some of the newer Redfish stuff. Um, and for instance, the Super Micro Sum utility, if any of you have had an opportunity to use that. Um, I've, I've, almost been able to get away from having to do OS level uh, firmware updates. Um, Broadcom cards still, uh, Broadcom LSI still requires um, typically an OS level entity. I, I thought know. they had EFI tools and Brian, you explored that long ago. Like I had ago. problems with those the last time I tried, okay. but that could, it, that could have been me. I, okay. you know, <laughs> It's it's you know it's always easy to fat finger I'm the sure. commands the wrong way when you're trying to do stuff, and you might break an HBA. <laughs> yeah, um, I prefer not to do that. Yeah, well, and those are <laughs> that's exactly what production user issues look like is all this. And thank you so much for exploring this. Hmm. 
Well, now that is a, a fantastic set of topics. And John, thanks for joining us. And Rebecca, thanks for rejoining. Um, other parting thoughts? I just like to thank everybody for doing this. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Have you watched any of the videos? I've watched a smattering of them. Yeah. Um, I, I find virtualization interesting. I am a old, old uh, mainframe programmer from the late 360, 370 days. And uh, I, I did a lot of work on CMS, which was a virtual machine. Um, you know, the old Baker to assist stuff that came in, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of the stuff that we do today, I, I kind of look at it and it's like, you know, it's this, it's the same thing with a different wrapper. Popeck um, and Goldberg, huh? Well, yeah. So, you know, take that all with a grain of salt because I realize we do a lot more stuff with it than we did back then. But it's, it's always interesting to watch this stuff and uh, <laughs> keep it in perspective. Uh, uh, sorry. Absolutely. You know, those, those who do not understand Unix are condemned to reinvent it poorly. <laughs> Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, one more thing. Is the ARM64 Beehive port in upstream yet? Ah, that is a very good question. I know Andrew Turner showed off some code that uh, Olivier gave a little screenshot of just before Asia Biz Econ, and that is indeed a fantastic question. I did reach out to Andrew after that, but haven't heard back a few minutes on Seagit might uh, answer that. Yes. But that's I a will... fantastic question. I will go and have a look. Thanks. Hey, yo, thanks for that... reminding me of it. <laughs> oh, on that topic. Oh, wait, well, Rebecca, did you order the Ampere workstation? And should we tell the kind people about that? Because it is quite exciting. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, I've ordered the Ampere Developer Kit, which is yeah. which claims to be like an IoT kit, um, but it's uh, yeah really powerful. It's got dim slots and all that stuff. So yeah, and I see five thousand, but I thought you can get around to two or three thousand for a bare unit. Uh, yes, not... it was around something like two and a half. Two and a half thousand um, dollars. Okay. So that is very reasonable considering um, they normally sell. Um, I mean, I, I've got the, uh, is it 80 core version um, yeah. coming? And yeah, normally that sells for about four or five thousand. So it's yeah. a substantial reduction in cost. And it's a beast. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to find a link for that. Do you recall the vendor name? I found the amp. Yes, email. it is I IPI Wiki um, or AdLink. Um, yeah, I will find the link here. I, I, yeah, found it. Boom. The rapid prototyping to do, do, do. Uh, Ampere Alta. That's it. Ultra. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, there are several no. ones. Uh, let's see. Oh. Um, IPI Wiki. Uh, Ampere Dev Kit. Oh, Ampere look. Development Platform. Uh, here we go. Um, yep, I will paste it in the Fantastic. chat. Let's have a look. Somebody give me an excuse to buy one of these. I know, right? Well, it would. <laughs> oh, 3,250 in that config, and jumping to 80 core was not too crazy. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, um, so yeah, you can also get access to um, Ampere machines um, very cheaply via the Oracle Cloud infrastructure. Right. Yeah, I had I had difficulty with sign up. I'll I'll have to give that another shot. What's the uh, how how what's the, what what are the acoustics like? Is it is it really loud? It's water cooled for what it's worth. So I think they're, and there's oh, some like Tom's God. hardware reviews and other nifty things. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, they're trying to push for an ecosystem. 
Uh, yeah, so the workstation that costs four or five thousand is water cooled, um, oh. but the IoT kit that I've bought, um, I have no idea what cooling requirements you actually have because it's just a bare board. Um, it might have a CPU fan, but yeah, that's that's all you get. You don't get any RAM storage, etc. PSU, etc. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the water cooled one. Um, and then yeah, if you go to the link I posted. Um, um, that's the you'll see the other one that I I actually bought. Oh, I so you could save a couple of thousand cool. if we can figure out how oh, to right. how to cool it. Yes. All right. That's, oh, that's this is so exciting. Yes, beautiful. I, yes. I've been just waiting like every day for the prices of uh, uh, a solid arm system to to beat a Mac Mini or a Mac Studio, which which are surprisingly good deals for for smaller range systems but this this might turn the tables this uh, might make it so that daniel have you seen this i know alan jude and company have such a thing but it's their seven six hundred dollar ish one yes i i got i have one of those as well is it running beehive uh no it's running uh windows 11 okay, um okay. i've heard there are efforts to get freebsd booting but um it's very much unsupported the firmware is all closed source and proprietary mm. and stuff and apparently the ufi implementation is very funky mm. and it doesn't have a bmc or anything the ampere systems run open bmc which is nice ah yes oh wow I so would. I could drop that into a data center. Wow. Um, all right. Next <laughs> next few months, this is happening. You've come to the right place. Yeah. And how's Beehive on ARM? It's fine, right? Or well, is it? That's where Andrew Turner has this? some patches as of not too long ago. Um, and again, Olivia posted a screenshot of like, hey, look, hey, I'm booting. <laughs> Please, yeah, so, that? so yeah, I am hoping to do some work once my Ampere system finally ships and arrives. I'm hoping to do some work and see if, we can, see if there are any improvements or bug fixes or anything um, that I can work on for that. So I'm just punching in some links here because these are definitely hot topics. I'm sure it'll come up, up at BSD can. Um, just for the sheer silliness of it. Let's see, slides, and then the work in progress, and whip Tokyo, and jumping to the point. Here we are on, scroll, 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 scrolly, scrolly, boom. Uh, that is the screenshot that Olivia, Olivier posted. Um, make it bigger. And yeah, hopefully it's still shared when I click share. Ah, I see. So it's running U-Boot as the boot firmware. That makes sense. Uh, so yeah, I will probably be working on getting UEFI on that as well. Fantastic. <laughs> so anyway, lots is going on. <sighs> That's grammatically correct. Anyway, other final thoughts or is that plenty to think about? <laughs> Well, uh, y'all are welcome to the jail and uh, beehive developer calls next week and uh, talk to you soon. I'm going to call it at 10.05 Pacific. I'll be around a few minutes. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. thanks, Michael, for organizing as always. My pleasure. Have a Thank great you. Time. Good to see everybody. Yeah, thanks. That's a fun call. Bye. Bye. Uh, have a good whatever your time zone is.